Welcome to today's Association of the United States Army Thought Leader Podcast on the future of the Corps and NATO. This is Colonel Retired Dan Roper, AUSA's Director of National Security Studies. I'll be serving as your host. To address this subject, we're fortunate to be joined by two exceptionally qualified thought leaders. Lieutenant General, United States Army Retired Sean McFarland and Dr. Jack Watling of the Royal United Services Institute, otherwise known as RUSI. You'll find their special report, The Future of the Core in NATO, at ausa.org slash publications slash AUSA studies. Lieutenant General Retired McFarland is Vice President for Weapons Programs at General Atomics Electromagnetic Systems. He's a non-resident senior fellow of Harvard's Belford Center and a senior fellow with AUSA. During his 37-year Army career, he commanded armor and cavalry units at every echelon while serving from the Folder Gap in Germany to the Balkans, Iraq, on the U.S. Southwest border and Afghanistan. As a brigade combat team commander in Ramadi, Iraq, he is credited with fostering the Sunni Arab Awakening, which was instrumental in turning the tide of the war. While commanding three corps, he also commanded all coalition forces in the war against the Islamic State in Iraq and Syria from 2015 to 2016, during which time coalition forces recaptured nearly half of the Islamic State's territory and set the conditions for their military defeat. Dr. Jack Watling is research fellow for land warfare at RUSI, the United Kingdom's leading defense and security think tank. Jack has recently conducted studies of deterrence against Russia, force modernization, partner force capacity building, the future of fires, and Iranian strategic culture. Prior to joining RUSI, he worked in Iraq, Mali, Rwanda, Brunei, and further afield. Originally a journalist, he's contributed to Reuters, The Atlantic, Foreign Policy, The Guardian, Jane's Intelligence Review, Haaretz, and others. Jack was shortlisted for the European Press Prize Distinguished Writing Award in 2016 and won the Breakaway Award at the International Media Awards in 2017. Gentlemen, welcome to Thought Leaders. Thank you for having us on. Yeah, it's great to be here, Dan. We're really looking forward to your commentary today. Recently read your paper and thought it was excellent. It brought up a number of points that are relevant to some of the most important decisions that the Army is trying to make right now. You observed that the character warfare has changed since 1991, and the Corps' role on the modern battlefield is not simply a return to Cold War doctrine. So before we explore your insights and recommendations on the future of the core of NATO, it'd be helpful if we review highlights of the relatively recent past, specifically since the end of the Cold War. So starting with you, General McFarland, could you describe for our listeners how the Corps in the United States and other Western armies has evolved since 1991? Well, obviously, it's undergone some significant changes. In 1991, the Corps was at its zenith in Desert Storm, where uh, it conducted operational maneuver. But since then, it's undergone significant restructuring that has removed a lot of its inherent capabilities, both in NATO and in the United States, as we optimize for counterinsurgency. And I'll just turn it over to Jack, who can talk to the NATO changes. On the U.S. side, obviously, we use the core headquarters as sort of a bill payer and as a headquarters that did not conduct operational maneuver in the field, but was really more of a intermediate headquarters overseeing static counterinsurgency areas of operation. Uh, Jack, what would you like to say about NATO? Thanks, Sean. I think that for European countries in particular, the need for a large warfighting organization was harder to articulate in the wake of the fall of the Soviet Union. And as a result, as Sean has just said, a lot of the enablers were taken away. But European militaries recognized that if a large-scale conflict were to develop, they needed to retain the expertise of that larger scale of command. And so there was a desire in the militaries to retain core headquarters, even though the mission sets that European countries were engaging with were requiring much smaller force packages. And therefore, what we saw was a kind of redefinition of the core away from a maneuver formation and a warfighting formation towards what became a rapid reaction concept. So starting with the Allied Rapid Reaction Corps in the UK and then followed by nine other corps in NATO, we've seen core headquarters become these centers of operational expertise for larger scale command. And they've been unencumbered headquarters that have been able to take over complex missions, humanitarian missions, peacekeeping missions as in the Balkans. But really, it's been about preserving that level of command and the muscle memory of how to do that in armies that haven't had the mass to actually generate those warfighting formations. And if I could just close out here, 
both NATO and the United States, our corps went from war fighting formations to more headquarters, as Jack has described. Although recently in the United States Army, we've begun to re-encumber our core headquarters in the past five years, assigning the divisions and separate brigades back to them to enable them to begin reforming that warfighting capability. This question sort of builds off the response you just gave on the previous 20 or 30 years of experience. The United States and other NATO armies have spent nearly two decades focused on counterinsurgency at the lower end of the warfighting spectrum without needing to contend or think about contending with a peer competitor. That clearly no longer is the case today with the military advancements and provocative actions of both Russia and China. So how has the return of great power competition affected the interest in the core level of command? As we look at peer competitors, we begin to talk about the concept of multi-domain battle or multi-domain operations. And we begin to see the need for multiple echelons in order to deal with the cognitive load that's going to be created by the speed, the complexity, and the scale of combat against a peer competitor. This was always the reason for having a core echelon between the division and the army. We no longer have field armies in the United States, per se. What we have, particularly in Europe, is a theater army, and it has huge responsibilities with joint RSOI, weapon system replacement, reconstitution operations, logistics, medical, communications, infrastructure, protection, force protection to include cyber protection, theater ballistic missile defense, and so on. These are all non-trivial tasks, and they cover a vast area of operations. Meanwhile, at the division and brigade level, the brigade's fighting the current fight, the division's helping the brigade and trying to shape the next fight. But you need another echelon somewhere between that theater army and the division that can focus better on shaping the fight after next, using and integrating all of the different warfighting functions. And at the core, where you first find all of the separate brigades that provide that kind of capability. And so what we're finding is that it's sort of the missing connecting file here in our ability to wage a high tempo operation is the core echelon. And so the U.S. military is beginning to reinvest in that, probably best indicated by the reconstitution of the 5th U.S. Corps with a forward headquarters in Europe. Jack, anything you want to add? In Europe, we have a number of armies that have focused on having tactical excellence at lower echelons. But as they now look towards deterrence against a peer adversary, they need to engage in a fires and counterfires battle, which is far larger than individual NATO members can service. And so in order to have the command and control capability to actually fight that battle and get their maneuver elements into contact and where they need to be, then you need a higher echelon that is able to integrate fires groups from multiple European states. And the complexities of that, the permissions involved, the legal process based on different rules of engagement, aligning all of those issues has been something that has been situated at the core because the core essentially sits at an echelon higher than any other NATO members except for the U.S. And so it's a critical enabler of tactical multinational activity. One other thought is as we increase the range of our indirect fire systems, what we're finding is that the brigade and certainly at the division level, weapons that can easily range into adjacent units sectors. And at that echelon where the brigade and the division sit, they can probably de-conflict fires between themselves, but to truly integrate them and get the most value from them, mass them where necessary, you need a higher echelon to coordinate that. And that would be where the Corps can provide that service. You both bring up the impact of the increased ranges and long range fires and the increased precision and what that means. The first question is about the impact of the fire system, and the second one will be about how that's done. So, based on these significant changes occurring, how does this affect the geometry of the battlefield? You know, how does this change the Corps' responsibility for planning, sustainment, and force protection? So in multi-domain operations, the size of the battlefield or the battle space is expanded considerably because of the range of the weapons. And I would say there are lethal and non-lethal weapons that contribute to that. The addition of the uh, cyber and space domains really make the entire planet part of any particular battle space because of the distributed nature of space-based and cyber or information technology assets. 
So given that, the ability to think in multiple dimensions in such a vast battle space is a huge cognitive challenge. And as our weapon systems not only increase in range, they increase in speed. Now we have hypersonic weapons coming online, and we have directed energy weapons. These are assisted by machine learning and artificial intelligence that can operate at computer clock speeds, obviously much faster than the human brain, which is not evolving at the same rate as technology. So I mentioned earlier cognitive load. So you have all of this really creating an incredible challenge for leaders who are probably operating on less than sufficient amounts of sleep and with incomplete information. And one of the aspects of multi-domain battle is, as we all know from our basic training, that you try to set a base of fire and maneuver against the flank to force the enemy to fight in more than one direction at the same time. Well, now the idea is not only to make the enemy fight in more than one direction and split its resources, but also to fight in multi-domains and create windows of opportunity against them. So how do you manage all of that? And that's really the question. And if you are really involved in the thrust and parry of a close fight as brigades and to a great extent divisions are, it's very difficult to think about all of these other capabilities and vulnerabilities. A core sits sufficient removed from that knife fight in a phone booth and can actually take advantage of those windows a little bit better than engage or divisions. So if General Sean has kind of looked at the extending range upwards, I'm going to go the other way and say that the real challenge with precision on the battlefield is that we still need to take the objective. We still need to be stuck into that close fight. But precision and long range fires, when you work out the boundaries and the ranges, are almost all reaching the divisional support area. And so the result is that the division is going to see a very significant displacement in its activity because the need to reduce the footprint of the division means that many of the supporting functions like intelligence, longer range reconnaissance, aviation that you might historically have based in the divisional deep, now those sites are really under significant threat and a level of threat that it's difficult to defend using point defense systems just because of the volume. And so pulling those assets back is an effective way of making sure that they can survive, while the critical task of the division is actually the sustainment fight and protecting its ground lines of communication to make sure that the brigades can sustain their effort. But if you're going to do that, then those intelligence functions and aviation assets and recce functions still need to be assigned. They still need to be prioritized and commanded. And if the division itself is not doing that or the divisional echelon, then I think that comes back to the core echelon. So I think we're not just seeing the core as a way of managing that cognitive load, but also playing a much more critical role, irrespective of the scale of the operations being conducted, because it's far enough from the front line that it can protect its own assets. You both bring up some very interesting points on the impact of the changing nature of fires and how that affects the geometry and how we organize at multiple levels, the cascading effect through the different echelons. Now, digging in a little bit more on the fires, it's the primary means by which the core is going to deliver lethal and non-lethal cross-domain effects. What role should the core play in the coordination delivery of fires, and how do you see the core interfacing with the emerging theater-level multi-domain task force, which is core to multi-domain operations? And how does the core interface with the Combined Joint Force Air Component Commander, the CJFAC, and the Combined Joint Force Land Component Commander, the CJ play. General McFarland? Yeah, I think it plays a critical role. The Corps used to have an organization known as the Corps Artillery, and now this to the Division Artillery Headquarters, commanded by a Brigadier General once upon a time. And you know, the role was to serve as the Force Field Artillery Headquarters, and they would typically designate one of their subordinate artillery brigades as counterfire headquarters. Well, now we've moved beyond just lethal fires into multi-domain fires, and really probably the Force Field Artillery Headquarters or the Corps Artillery might be uh, better designated as the multi-domain fires headquarters. With responsibility for integrating cyber electronic warfare and to a lesser extent, perhaps information operations with lethal fires in order to facilitate the operation. You know, you mentioned that the core principally fights with fires, whereas divisions and below fight principally with maneuver. So the core is well positioned to straddle what the division is doing and what the core is trying to do with shaping operations with fires and integrate with the theater level multi-domain task force. 
So that really is the beginning of it, then following on to integrating joint fires. Of course, the Corps in the United States military have their air support operations groups led by an Air Force colonel and the joint air ground integration centers that are distributed to the command post, the core and division level where that integration occurs. But to influence the planning of air operations or joint fires operations into a land-centric battle space requires a relatively senior staff with the experience that comes with that. And once again, I think that points to the importance of the core in that type of a fight. Jack? I'm obviously not as qualified to speak about exactly how the core fits into U.S. operations, but in terms of cyber capability as a good example of where I think the utility of the core in MDO is very evident. Cyber capabilities tend to be held at very high classification as the first issue. And so the number of people that you can appropriately brief to conduct detailed planning about how you might leverage a cyber capability in connection with a scheme of maneuver or another military ground activity is going to constrain how low you can go in a force. The other thing I'd flag is that when we're talking about cyber capabilities, you might be able to activate a cyber capability during wartime, but in placing a cyber capability will often take one to three years. And so it's actually an activity that is pursued in competition rather than during conflict. And that means that you are having to operate in a politically complicated environment. You're having to lay the groundwork while you're operating in that compete space potentially accessing enemy cyber systems through civilian networks because they interface with one another. The threat vector can be quite diverse and therefore getting the political permissions from your allies where you might be operating and from your own governments who are worried about proliferation of the capability means that you actually need quite senior officers to have the appropriate clout and lead those discussions with their civilian counterparts, both among allies and in your own country. And for those reasons, I think it's going to be quite difficult to bring some of those cyber capabilities to bear at lower echelons than core. You might be able to do it at division, particularly in the UK, where we kind of optimize for that level. But realistically, I think it fits pretty close to the core level. As I was listening to both your explanations, a thought popped into my head that this sort of gets to why MDO is different than airland battle as you read the publications on it and you read the concept itself. And it brings up the difference between synchronizing and the tenet of convergence. So could either of you help our listeners understand a little bit better the difference between synchronization and convergence? So convergence is an evolving concept, and I don't pretend to have the definitive answer on it, but obviously synchronization has been around for a while, and the idea is to get all the war fighting systems or battlefield operating systems, as they were once called, operating in unison in space and time in order to support the operational concept. The concept of convergence is different than synchronization in that, first of all, it introduces additional domains, and the idea is to bring effects across domains into a specific space and time. But it also is related to the uh, convergence of various technologies and other things that are going on around us and around the battle space that really allow things like artificial intelligence, directed energy technologies, the local political and informational environment all come into play. So you're operating in a converged environment while you're trying to converge effects within that converged environment. That may not be the accepted understanding of convergence, but that's the way I think about it anyway. (laughs) Jack maybe has a better answer than I do. I probably don't have a doctrinally approved answer, but the way I like to think about it is synchronization is what you get when you have a plan and you follow the order sheet. So if we think about 1991, and if an aircraft conducts an airstrike, uh, another aircraft will go and do a battle damage assessment. That information will go back to the CAOC. And if it needs to be struck again, or if there's other targets that are identified from the flight that did the BDA, then it will get added to the next day's sortie list and prioritized. That's a kind of synchronized approach, and you can integrate different elements of the force, ground units, and so forth into that synchronized fires plan. Where we're talking about convergence, I think it reflects the fact that we're now dealing with a very frenetic battlefield where most of the targets and infrastructure move quite frequently and is agile. And so let's say you have an aircraft that's returning from a sortie and through its passive onboard sensors, it detects a SAM system. It can't engage it because it's used its munitions on the sortie. 
it's no use coming back, debriefing, saying, hey, I saw a SAM system there and then generating a flight down the line to go and attack it because that's a mobile system. Even Russian strategic SAMs move around a lot. So what you need is to be able to offboard that data quickly. You need to get that data to a shooter that still has munitions available. And that shooter might be a ground-based unit. The range of modern artillery means that it's often entirely viable for a ground unit to engage that target. They wouldn't be able to without the convergence of the air campaign and the land campaign providing the data for them to actually know there's something to shoot. And so it's more about making units optimize organically the distribution of targets that they go after on the battlefield by making sure that there is sufficient data moving around the system that you are engaging the right target with the right asset in a time that is relevant rather than a time frame which is the constraints of your planning cycle. It strikes me from your comments that we've had throughout this podcast thus far that the core echelon might be the most important level for NDO to come together and be an effective concept that ultimately turns into effective doctrine. But in your paper, you also observed that at the core echelon, this will likely be where the NATO C2 network will be under the greatest stress. So what steps should be taken to deal with this tension? I'll let Jack answer that one first. Okay, Jack. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. I mean, it's a, it's a great question. I think the biggest challenge for a lot of the JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control concepts and multiple domain operations concepts when we're dealing with the land environment is the number of sensors that are on the battlefield. And if you make that a tactical problem at the brigade level, it's almost impossible for those units to have the infrastructure on the battlefield and protect it because of the emissions that the infrastructure generates to actually be able to transmit the data that we need. You just can't get the bandwidth in place. And so I think when we're talking about investment of signals capability, prioritizing the core as the echelon that can support a lot of the infrastructure to enable the relevant information to be pushed up the force and also down the force, that's kind of where we need to prioritize those assets. Some of it will be at links into division, but if you try and make that tactical communications issue a issue for the edge, then irrespective of how quickly the systems themselves can process data, we are going to run into massive bottlenecks because of the bandwidth through military communications that you can actually get off a land-based tactical platform. And so I think that the balance of investment for signals probably sits as a issue that the core needs to own. And the other reason the core needs to own it is that when we're dealing with a multinational effort, you need to make sure that your subordinate divisions that are coming from multiple nations can plug and play with those systems. And so because the core is going to have to integrate those units, it also needs a leading role in telling everyone what the standards are. Yeah, if I could just pick up on that thread, one of my greatest challenges when I commanded Combined Joint Task Force Operation Inherent Resolve, and also when I was Deputy Chief of Staff for Operations in Afghanistan, was the interoperability question. You have the concentric circles, you have the secret no foreign within the U.S., and then you have the Five Eyes group, and then NATO, and then you have non-NATO, and ever-expanding circles of trust. And when I commanded Inherent Resolve, we had 29 different nations just in my headquarters alone, and trying to establish a common network for everybody to pass classified information took an incredibly long time. I won't say how long, but you'd be shocked if I did. We can't have that in this kind of a situation where you're dealing with a peer competitor because the opponent, the enemy, is operating off of a single network with a single language, and that gives them a competitive advantage. So the interoperability issue, getting through all of these challenges, which are really more policy-driven than technology-driven, is a critical step. And at the core level, we have a signal brigade in the United States Army that can be the central headquarters for integrating all of those different troop-contributing nations into the central network. It's not a trivial task, not by any stretch. I'd like to ask one more question prior to asking for your final thoughts. It partially was brought up by both of you in your response to the last question. While the benefits far outweigh the costs, operating with allies and partners takes work. While always challenging, it seems like achieving interoperability may be even more daunting while simultaneously fighting across five domains as envisioned in MDO. So how does the core in NATO help overcome these challenges? So in multi-domain operations, one of the concepts and Jack referenced it earlier, is the competition that occurs prior to and after and sometimes in conjunction with conflict. 
competing against an adversary provides us with that opportunity to really try to get all of our oars in the water giving way together through a series of exercises and exchanges. And this really speaks to the importance of the United States placing a core headquarters back into the NATO mix permanently because you cannot develop this interoperability episodically. It has to be a sustained effort. And when U.S. Army Europe was at its full size during the Cold War, the partnership arrangements that we had and relationships were critical to being able to fight together on the battlefield against a unified threat. Well, you know, we're not going to be a unified force, but we can at least mitigate some of the most dangerous aspects of being an allied force through a sustained focus on working through all of those issues. And as I said, the best way to do that is with a series of realistic exercises, both live and in the constructive environments. In other words, command post exercises. And then building those bonds of trust so that when the bullets begin to fly, commanders know one another, staffs know one another. And even in the absence of communications, they can work together. Jack? So I'd reinforce the need for exercises because you're never going to get it perfect. You know, there will always be differences in procedure and culture and permissions and systems that you need to come up with slightly kludged workarounds for. And the only way that you can identify them usually is by trying it out. So actually, yeah, the formation of five core and the kind of joint exercise structure is absolutely critical. But there is another side to this, which is the engagement in interoperability during capability development. You know, a lot of European militaries are modernizing at the moment and trying to modernize their communications. And one of the challenges they have is that they don't know what the standards are to be able to interface with MDO, which means that they can't design their own national systems to be MDO compatible. They don't know what that looks like. And to be fair, the U.S. doesn't either at this point because it's still building this capability. You know, JADC2 is not in place yet. And so I think there is an interesting and difficult conversation to be had about whether the U.S. expects to fight as a U.S. sovereign formation with allied sovereign formations next to it, or whether this strong multinational team is the objective. And if that is still the objective, then the U.S. will need to look at whether it either works hard to determine those standards and provide them to allies so that they can meet them, or whether the U.S. actually pays to convert allied systems into a system which can play with the U.S. system, because the U.S. has done that historically, particularly the U.S. Navy with allies when it's been operating. It's essentially provided those comms kits to its allies. But it's very, very difficult because of limited resource for U.S. allies to build their own sovereign systems and then have to change them because the U.S. has determined that it needs a different set of requirements. And so I think that one of the critical elements to getting this right is using the U.S.'s network of liaison officers in capability directorates around Europe to make sure that there is sufficient understanding to avoid wasted resource. I think you just brought up a huge point because just looking at what MDO is right now, MDO is a U.S. Army concept. So the U.S. Army owns that, or at least it's approved the current concept, but the U.S. military does not yet even have a joint all domains operations concept. It's in development and it should be out in a couple months, but that just gets the U.S. military all on the same page. And then it's got to inform and be informed by what's happening in its partners and allies' armies. And it seems like data is a place where it all comes together or doesn't. And then the procedures have to reinforce that. I think we just need to wrap up here, unfortunately, but you've raised some fantastic issues. The importance of the war fighting formation, the cognitive load of MDO, the sustained effort of interoperability, which the two of you just very thoroughly helped us understand the challenges of, and just prioritizing the core as an echelon. In addition to the fact that it is now a war fighting formation that we recognize, we need to get back in the force. So I'd like to turn it over to you both just to see if you've got any parting thoughts or comments to our listeners. Thanks, Dan. Uh, no, it's been a good conversation. And I am heartened to see that growing recognition of the importance of this echelon and growing level of investment. And I think if we continue on this trend line, we'll be, we'll be in a good position here to deter any potential aggression. And that's really what this is all about. If we can avoid using these cores against a peer competitor, that would be the best possible outcome. But right now, we've got our work cut out for us. I think I would just end with the observation that the core historically has been considered a level of command, and it remains that. 
but on the modern battlefield, it is also engaged in its own very difficult fight, and it will be taking casualties. We've seen that in Nagorno-Karabakh, where the depths highlight the fact that rear echelons will be attrited simultaneously with those of the front. And so we've historically kind of viewed the process of alliance building as you demonstrate your intent, you show that you've got skin in the game by contributing frontline combat units, and then higher echelons as you kind of build up. Given that a lot of NATO members can't generate large combat formations like a core or even a division in many cases, I think we need to have some difficult conversations about recognizing countries that choose not to provide a frontline brigade of armor that's not interoperable with other players in NATO and instead say, right, but if you can take the enablers from that formation and give it to a core echelon, then that is equally valuable because that provides something that the alliance can use. And I think when we build these multinational formations, the aim has to be to build something that is greater than the sum of its parts. It's a great note on which to end. Thank you, Lieutenant General Sean McFarland and Dr. Jack Watling for being with us today and sharing your insights and experiences on a subject so important to the United States and other NATO armies. We look forward to following the progress, implementing your insightful recommendations to better prepare for combined multi-domain operations by leveraging the capabilities provided by the Corps. To all our listeners, thanks for joining us. Be sure to subscribe to the Army Matters podcast on iTunes and everywhere podcasts are found. The Army Matters podcast series is brought to you by the Association of the United States Army, the U.S. Army's professional association, member-supported, Army-connected. Visit us at AUSA.org for more information or to become a member. Your membership helps AUSA continue to carry out its mission to educate, inform, and connect with the total Army our industry partners, and our supporters of a strong national defense. For questions or to provide topic recommendations, email us at podcast at AUSA.org. Have a great Army Day. Hooah.